Good morning. morning. Welcome to the third Sunday in Lent. We will start off with singing hymn 306, Before You, God, the Judge of All. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with favor on your humble servants 
and stretch out the right hand of your power to defend us against all of our enemies. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson for this third Sunday in Advent comes from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who mis misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your maidservant or maidservant, nor the animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that it may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to, the, to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. We now sing Psalm 19, and we will sing it in unison. <clears throat>
The second lesson for this morning comes to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Jews demanded miraculous signs, and Greeks looked for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. The word of the Lord. We now sing the verse of the day. stand for the gospel. Our gospel for this morning comes from John chapter 2. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here! How dare you turn my father's house into a market! His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The word of the Lord. We now say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. We now sing him 456, and you may be seated. <clears throat>
Peace to all of you <clears throat> who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. In the name of our Jesus, the Son of God and the Savior of the world, dear friends, here is a brief English grammar quiz. Do you know what a homograph is? A homograph is a word that is spelled exactly like another and pronounced the same but has a vastly different meaning. An example of a homograph might be the word bear, B-E-A-R. As a verb, it means to support or to carry. As a noun, it talks about an animal. There's a homograph in our text. It is the word temple. In our text, the word temple is pronounced the same, and it is spelled the same, but it has two different meanings. It describes, first of all, a place dedicated to the worship of the true God, and then it describes a place in which the true God lives. During the first Passover that occurred during his public ministry, Jesus made a bold statement concerning the temple. He cleansed his father's temple, and he made a bold prediction about his own temple. John writes, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Two and a half million. Some scholars estimate that two and a half million people went up to Jerusalem for the Passover. They base their estimate on the fact that every male from Every Jewish male from the age of 12 and older was required to go to the Passover. You might say it was a very big deal. And while those people were there, they had to pay a temple tax, and some of them had to sacrifice a year-old male lamb. With that many visitors there and needing to pay their sacrifice, meaning to pay their temple tax, and to sacrifice that year-old lamb, it was only natural that business was being conducted in the temple courts. The temple was actually a complex of buildings. There was the sanctuary in which the holy place and the most holy place were located. And then there were four other courts, outer courts, where various people gathered. It was in those outer courts that business was being conducted specifically concerning the Passover. There were merchants selling animals like birds and doves and lambs, and there were money changers exchanging foreign Jews' money for a specific Jewish coin needed to pay the temple tax. These courts were the entrance to God's house, and they were the prelude to God's presence. Yet all that was taking place in these outer courts was a distraction for the people who had come to Jerusalem to reverently worship God. With all the people that were there who needed to pay their temple tax and to sacrifice their year-old lamb, there was an opportunity for merchants to exploit the people, much like a vendor at a theater or a stadium. They had a corner on the market, and so they could charge exorbitant prices for the animals the people used. And they could ex charge exorbitant fees for exchanging the money of the foreigners into that specific Jewish coin. Most likely graft and greed were commonplace. 
And because there were so, and so many animals present there, the temple courts probably began to smell like the animal barn at the county fair. The smell of the animals and the stench of their filth most likely filled the air. And the temple courts probably sounded like a busy mall with the bleeding and lowing of animals, the clinking of thousands of coins, and the din of countless voices. The temple had become a place of business instead of a place of worship. It was hardly conducive for people to reverently worship God, the purpose for which they had come to Jerusalem. It was quite concerning to Jesus that some people had made his father's house a place of business and were depriving the people of the opportunity to reverently worship God. So Jesus made sure people had the opportunity to reverently worship God. John tells us that he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle, at the same time, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their temples. And he told those selling doves, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? That last statement of Jesus says it all, doesn't it? Jesus did not want anyone deprived of the opportunity to reverently worship God. So he cleansed his father's temple. Jesus was concerned about the reverent worship of God. Are we? Is it conducive to worship for yourself and others to speak until the bell has rung or even after? Are the things we take care of on Sunday afternoons on our minds during Sunday worship? Are we getting enough sleep on Saturday night so we can reverently worship Jesus on Sunday morning? Are our hearts filled with fears and worries during Sunday morning worship instead of praise and thanks to our God who has done so much for us? Are we depriving ourselves and others of the opportunity to reverently worship God by breaking the third commandment? Let your conscience be your guide. With boldness, Jesus cleansed his father's temple, and that cleansing of his father's temple then led to Jesus making a prediction about his own temple. John continues, then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. When Jesus cleansed the temple, he was making the claim that he was the Son of God because what did he call the temple? My Father's house. At the same time, he was claiming to be the Messiah, the promised Savior. Because the prophet Malachi said that this purification of the temple was an act to be carried out by the Messiah. Malachi wrote, See, I will send my messenger, who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Jesus was claiming that he was the promised Messiah. Now, Jesus' enemies, the unbelieving Jews, also recognized Jesus' action as an act that would only and could only be carried out by the Messiah. 
And the fact that Jesus did it upset them. It upset them because Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God and a promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so they asked Jesus to give them a sign. A miraculous deed of some sort done by Jesus to prove that he had authority to cleanse the temple and to make the claim that he was the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. Well, Jesus responded, and he gave them a sign, only it came in much like a riddle, if you could say that. He said to them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus was not speaking about the temple they could all see with their eyes, the place where God dwelled, that temple made of stones and mortar. No, Jesus was talking about his own body, his earthly body in which God true and actually did dwell. Jesus' sign was to be understood this way. Jesus' enemies would destroy his earthly body by putting him to death, but after three days he would rise. Jesus' resurrection and his empty tomb would prove that he is the Messiah and the Son of God. Listen to what Paul wrote. Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. But Jesus' enemies totally misunderstood Jesus' sign. They took his words in their most literal sense. They responded, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? They misunderstood that Jesus was talking about the temple they could all see. And they were very skeptical that he was going to destroy that temple and raise it in three days. Something that had taken 46 years, or 36 years, 46 years to build. Jesus' enemies, those unbelieving Jews, didn't believe Jesus' sign when it was given. And nor did they believe it when it was fulfilled. When Jesus came alive after they put him to death and his tomb was empty, they still did not believe. It had no effect on them. They did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God nor the promised Savior because their hearts were hard. While Jesus' enemies did not believe Jesus' sign, those first disciples did. After Jesus rose from the dead, they remembered Jesus' sign about the temple and it being destroyed. And they connected that with a portion of scripture that would speak about the Messiah's resurrection. Psalm 16. These are words of David, but they are the words of the Messiah. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. When the disciples put all the dots together, their faith in Jesus was strengthened. And they believed even more that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised Savior. Along with those first disciples, we believe that the risen Jesus is the Savior. We believe that the risen Jesus is our Savior, and that is very comforting to us dreadful sinners. Our sins bother us. Our sins upset us. Sometimes our sins keep us awake at night because we know what we deserve. Paul is very blunt. The wages of sin is death. And the devil will just not let us forget that sometimes. As he beats us with the cudgel of our sin and its consequences. And badgers us with the news that we ought to go to hell for our sins. But we can tell the devil to go back to hell. And to stop bothering us because we know that Jesus is our Savior. We know that because of Jesus and his resurrection, our sins are forgiven 
And we are right with God. Paul wrote this, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification because we are convinced that Jesus is our Savior. We can quiet our guilty consciences and we can put our sin-burdened minds at ease. We can rest comfortably knowing that our sins will not send us to hell and we can rejoice that we will, like our Jesus, one day rise from death to live and rule eternally. As you leave this temple of God, go with a renewed knowledge and confidence that Jesus has risen, that your sins are forgiven, and that you will rise to live eternally. Amen. <coughs> the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will continue by praying responsibly the prayer of the church, which begins on the middle of page number seven. <laughs> Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts to unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, Without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace, 
and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember and mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help with deeds of kindness. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith, and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We will continue with the order of service for Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, holy. given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
all of your sins. Take drink, this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of This true body and this true blood will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until the day of life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace. of all of your sins. Take drink, this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This true body and this true blood will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until the day of life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace.
Amen. Depart in peace. Christ poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This true body and this true blood will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until the day of life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace. Please rise and join me in singing the song of Simeon. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen. 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 We'll close this morning with hymn 319. You may be seated. of things. If you don't know who the gentleman doing the liturgy this morning was, that is my son August. He is a first year seminarian at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, studying to be a pastor, and we thank Gus for his service this morning. Just a couple of things. We will have Sunday morning Bible class next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. We are studying Jesus parables. We're almost to the end of that. Uh, you're always welcome for that. Um, there will be confirmation this Tuesday. So I believe it's a quiz on Unit 10 and Study Unit 11. There's Lenten worship Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, coffee hour after the service. Our evangelism committee meeting will be postponed until next Sunday after the service. Um, we're having an Easter Bible school on the 23rd of March. Um, I believe there's a sign-up sheet for students. Um, and if you have any questions or if you'd like to help, please speak with Laura. Um, let me turn the page. The important one, please remember to set your clocks ahead next Saturday night. Uh, daylight saving time begins <coughs> next Sunday morning. And I believe that there are sign-up sheets for Easter lilies on the bulletin board in the back where uh, you sign up for flowers. Uh, I have nothing else. Um, we would also like to thank you for, again, for your prayers and your meals. They have been very uh, helpful to us. If you continue to pray for all of us, we'd appreciate that very much. Uh, I have nothing else, anybody? All right, thank you very much. Oh, Carol, and there's a sewing event, April 6th, yes. Sewing, there's a sewing event, an evangelism event, it's April 6th, right? And there's a sign-up sheet on this bulletin board over here for that. Uh, if you have any questions, you can talk to Carol about that. Thank you very much. God bless your day. Mm -hmm.